Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss the Rakhigari skeleton and the archaeogenetic evidence or ancient DNA evidence that has been discovered from that skeleton. To discuss this and other issues, we have with us Professor Satyajit Rath, who teaches in Pune and who was uh, very much a part of the Delhi Science Forum and the All India People Science Network. Satyajit, first let's discuss the science itself because I think in the, shall we say, the larger historical debates, because the Aryan invasion, the Indo-Aryan people, peopling of South Asia, all these issues, the essential scientific achievement sort of goes to the background. This particular event of reconstructing from the skeletons of Rakhigari, and in this particular case, they succeeded with only one skeleton. This is a major scientific achievement. It's a monumental scientific achievement. But let me um, add a caveat to what you said. Last week, there was not one paper published. Last week, there were two papers published by the same, well, not by the same, but by an overlapping group of global collaborators from an extraordinarily wide range of scholarly disciplines. But this is the paper we have discussed earlier, which is also was archived as a preprint and has now been published officially in science. Therefore, the authors could not discuss it for the last six to eight months, but we have already discussed it earlier. So the science paper therefore forms the background in the sense that this is a technological tour de force. 500 plus ancient genomes from about 500 years to about 10,000 years old from backwards from the present day have been not totally but significantly substantially sequenced and genetic relatedness between them and genetic relatedness with present day populations has been established. That's the background on which the selfie, the, uh, what everybody is now referring to as the Rakhigadi paper, um, uh, acquires its nuance as well as its importance. So the distinction is that most of these 500 plus are from archaeological sites, skeletons from archaeological sites, where the weather conditions are much more conducive to some preservation of ancient DNA deep in bones. Rakhigadi is the only one that is indubitably from the subcontinent with all our tropical, subtropical uh, climatic conditions where DNA recovery is extraordinarily hard because the weather conditions uh, allow both non-microbe and microbe-driven degradation of DNA. So very little DNA is recovered technically. The, in, in, in simple terms, the warmer the weather, while you can find bones, getting readable DNA out of bones becomes harder and harder. And on top of that, you have the microbial action also, which degrades the DNA? Well, yes, but keep in mind that the weather also impacts microbial density. The warmer the weather, the more microbial activity you're going to have. Okay. So those are uh, interrelated related, uh, issues. And as a result, it's no surprise that many of the bones, they've tried six or seven different skeletons, many of the bones that we tried from Akhigadi um, really didn't give any information. Keep in mind another technical problem that all of us tend to lose which is we are dealing with extraordinarily minute amounts of DNA. They are so small that they can be swamped by accidental contamination. The samples the are very small, in, therefore they can be easily drowned out by they can, extraneous exactly. matter which is contamination. Right. When you, when you collect them, when you collect the bone, at least the DNA is inside the bone, so you can treat the outside of the bone and get rid of whatever stuck to it. But even in the laboratory, there is always the possibility of accidental contamination. Now, if you get lots of DNA out of the bone, then small accidental contaminations you can exclude quite easily. 
but when you get really small amounts, it's very hard. So what um, David Reich, Wagish, Narsihan and their colleagues have done in Harvard is a technological tour de force um, that we should be appreciative of, just as we should be appreciative of uh, the um, technological achievements of the Chandrayaan. Got it. Um, it's, it's that simply an outstanding achievement. And if just to explain to our viewers that if you have lots of noise, but your signal is very strong, then of course it doesn't matter. You can easily pick up the signal. But like for instance, the voice in background uh, noise. But if the signal itself is very weak, the voice is weak, then the noise obviously drowns it out. And this is analogous to what the DNA signatures you are talking about. That contamination yes. is in this case the noise and it can drown out what is the essential signal, which is the ancient DNA. Absolutely, well put. So, um, which is why the, uh, the cell paper of Shindeta actually spends a fair amount of time describing not just how and what they have done in technological terms, but doing multiple um, testing to ensure that they really have ancient DNA. They've taken about 100 times they have done this in order to really verify the results. And they said this one Not skeleton... simply that. Yeah, go ahead. Not simply that. They have actually then done the um, software analysis, the bioinformatic analysis, in a variety of ways to ensure that what they have is actually a unique sequence that's very unlikely to have come from any contemporary source. And <clears throat> this technically should be kept in mind when we come to discussing the implications of um, what this information tells us. You know, there's one particular element in all, in all of this, <coughs> that this archaeogenetic studies have really three major components. One is the genetic component, which is the ability to multiply the any DNA sample and produce really millions of copies then which you process. So this is I would call the biological part of it if you will and of course it has biological sensors and so on but it's really at the realm of biology. The second is what you said the bioinformatic part of it which is really being able to reconstruct the sequences, match, cross match etc etc and also the fact that you have millions of copies from which you are collating this information. So that itself is a monumental, shall we say, mathematical uh, computer science uh, exercise. The third which is also forgotten, of course not so much in the cell paper, but if you take the science paper, that what is called the mixing models, that you would take current uh, ge genetic evidence and you take this, then you need to have mixing models to predict how do you see this happen and you get the current, that you see the current, uh, shall we say, profile of people. So these are three elements to the science of it, as it were, which is something which is, I think, sort of not understood. And of course, genetics is the most exciting because it's a new one in that sense. Yes, all of this said, let us keep in mind limitations. This is not an entire sequence. Every last nucleotide on this woman buried uh, 45, 4800 years ago has not been sequenced. Um, what we are doing with the informatic analysis is, despite all its statistical reliability, essentially still statistic probability. And the kind of models that we build then become, no matter how robust they are, still derivatives from an original statistical problem. So this is the kind of evidence that we should be incorporating and integrating into a whole range of disciplinary kinds of evidence, be it from linguistics, from textual analysis, from archaeology, from other historical sources, 
um, from archaeology uh, and a um, number of related disciplines to come up with some understanding of migrations. Let me make one um, final point in this context about the idea of migrations. This is a sequence of a woman who is buried in Rakhigarh. In and of itself, the sequence doesn't tell us anything about who, from where, and went where. It is only when you integrate information that is collected in this diversity of disciplines across a temporal climb that you begin to build likelihood models of migration. All of this we should keep in mind as an ongoing learning process, other than making assertions about final proofs of something or the other. You know, that brings us to the next logical question. There is Professor Shinde, who is one of the authors of the paper. In fact, he's the first author. He's an archaeologist, from what I gather. But he is supposed to have said, of course, we don't have independent verification of what he's supposed to have said. But according to papers, he is supposed to have made the following observations. That this proves there is no Aryan migration. And he talks about Mortimer Wheeler, which is really pre-independence, uh, shall we say, uh, studies which were done, which were very preliminary. And Mohenjadar Harappa, as you know, was 1920s. So that's really something which is very much in its infancy. And the Aryan invasion theory has been discarded from 60s onwards, saying migrations, yes, but large scale invasion, no. This is, I think, Romila 60s ancient Indian history congress uh, presidential address. So all of that uh, to have been now brought out by uh, Professor Shinde to say the quoting Mortimer Wheeler, there is no Aryan invasion, seems to be tilting at windmills. And secondly, how do you provide any information from the Rakigari skeleton that there was no migration from the steppes carrying the Indo-European languages? First, genes don't tell us anything about language anyway. And secondly, how do you then explain, shall we say, in North, over North India, the genetic markers of the steppes people, particularly in certain caste and communities, as the companion paper that we talked about, the science paper shows that exists. Could you explain to our viewers what is the mystery that Shinde is presenting us on the basis of the cell paper and how seriously we can take it aside? Professor Shinde is an archaeologist and an archaeologist of um, reputation, standing and persistence. He has led the Rakhigadi uh, excavations. And unlike many other archaeologists, clearly he has been open-minded enough to partner with geneticists in an effort to add um, integrating lines of evidence. All of this, I think we should be appreciative of. That said, let me start That said, let me start um, the conversation not so much by a discussion of history itself, but by a discussion of what this actually is in the cell paper. So the cell paper makes three inferences. The first inference is that a substantial similarity exists with the maternal lineage of this woman, um, this elite woman, since she was ceremonially buried. I doubt very much that ordinary people were ceremonially buried in any human culture. Uh, the maternal lineage of this woman is deeply South Asian, ancient South Asian. 60, 65,000 years hunter-gatherers. Going back to the first people of South Asia. This, given the fact that a lot of other genes have crept into her genome subsequently, underlines a basic sad 
uh, apparent truth of our species, which seems to be that when we spread into territories where there were no pre-existing human communities, we go men and women together. When we re-spread into territories where there are already people, we apparently go as men, much more than women. And one can now begin to draw further interpretations, inferences from this, what I consider to be a sad fact of our uh, species. Secondly, where does this um, quote, new unquote genetic footprint in her DNA come from? And the answer is that it is, let's not use the phrase come from, it is related to Central West Asian, um, um, what you can call the Anatolian, um, Irani, Zagro, this general area across the uh, tigris euphrates basin. Um, there have been genomes, this both ancient and contemporary, and her DNA is basically related to those. But our bioinformatic analysis, what you call uh, our, our cutting edge computer analysis, uh, are now sophisticated enough to allow us to do further dissection. And an extraordinarily interesting part. We've been assuming that 20,000 years ago, agriculture was initiated in the fertile crescent, in the Tigris Euphrates, and so on and so forth. And we've discussed about whether agriculture spread from there, both into Europe, uh, not westwards, and into um, South Asia, cultural diffusion and placement and so on and so forth. And the truth is always seems to be some combination of these. It's evident that the relatively non-ancient part of her DNA comes from, or I take that back, is related to the um, uh, genetic footprints found in West Central Asia, uh, across the Tigris Euphrates Valley, Iran, Zag Zagros Mountains, and so on and so forth. Now, that's where agriculture started eight million years ago. So our assumption has been for a long time that these agriculturists, as they spread agriculture, both through cultural diffusion and through um, intermarriage, let us call it likely, um, speed the practice of agriculture. So the simple expectation was, since agriculture in the Indus Valley is a couple of thousand years later at best than agriculture in the fertile crescent by available evidence so far, that that's how agriculture came to the Indus Valley as well. The Genetic expectation then is that the West and Central Asian component of her genome will be related to the farming community of the Fertile Crescent. And astonishingly, now sophisticated um, in mass analyses are good enough to make the case that not that they're related, but their relationship goes back to days prior to agriculture. Well, I have a rider over here, which is, you know, <coughs> this is something you see across the Fertile Crescent, uh, that people mixing is less, but agriculture seems to have sprung up at a, in this arc almost quasi simultaneously. So I would argue that knowledge traveled, of course, it seems. So the migration rates were very low, but people must have traveled to have this information. And I would say the we are probably losing sight of that agriculture or proto agriculture would have had a longer time while it was still sort of migrant uh, semi 
migratory communities moving from place to place, but in selected places by which they were actually developing agriculture. So I would say that that evidence is still not to me that was there a proto-agriculture phase or not is an open question. Oh, no, no, no. no. So, so this is where we begin to, uh, I think, jump into uh, political prejudices rather than looking at the data themselves. The data themselves are saying something interesting to scholars. The data are saying that the um, West Central Asian contribution to uh, the Indus Valley civilization's DNA, based on one sample, is not directly from the farmers. Yes. This does not say anything at all about whether agriculture was independently discovered in the Indus Valley or what or where or where. It is simply an interesting nuance on an ongoing discussion in scholarship about understanding our heritage. Okay, so all we can say is that in we have a bifurcation between the hunter-gatherers of uh, Zagros Mountains, the Iranian, uh, shall we say, the hills, and the Harappan population that takes place 12,000 years back and that predates the Harappan civilization, as we would call it, the growth of agriculture and the cities in this place. That's, that's what we, we can talk about. The split also predates the agriculture development in the fertile crescent. As well as here, obviously, both places. Genetic place. Yes. So there is evidence so there for. Now, yeah. Go ahead. So now, rather than the simple model that agriculturists came and populated uh, South Asia, we now have an even more complex model of a combination of cultural and genetic influences that is fascinating to work out in whichever direction it goes. And it would also be so a lot of, lot of, shall we say, crop genetic evidence which should now be added to this. This is what I was come to at the end but you brought it up so I would be delighted if we begin to do crop archaeogenetics. Mm. Yeah because that would so, really have a much stronger component relating to this. It, where, would, be, it would be independent evidence absolutely. and in all the historiography independent evidence carries massive value. So that was one element of the Rakigari uh, story. Right. The, second the third one. component of Rakigari that is provided that I find utterly fascinating, in fact, perhaps the most fascinating, is what political prejudice is presenting as an out of India theory uh, support. And I am amused by uh, political prejudice because I think that that evidence is telling us something far more fascinating than some silly um, chauvinist out of India notions. Here's what it shows us. It shows us that of the 520 genomes in the science paper, 523 or what, um, because there's that many of them, many genomes come from single archaeological sites. Uh, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, around the East. in um, Eastern Iran, in Turkmenistan, and so So, in these clusters, it is therefore now in informatic uh, analysis possible. Do all of them cluster together? Do all of them look like each other? And the answer is, in science paper, yes, most of them look like each other. But there are always outliers, and you don't know why the outliers are outliers. So here's where the Rakhi Gadi cell paper intersects 520 plus genome paper, that is the science paper, in two locations from the science paper that are sort of um, archaeogeographically, if you like, closer to Rakhi Gadi. Which is the Indus Valley One, periphery, the authors call it. In this very periphery, one in Bunur in eastern Iran and one in Ch uh, uh, Softa in Turkmenistan, they found these clusters of genomes 
with some outliers. So they did something that I think was incredibly insightful, at least in retrospect. They asked, are those outliers in those locations related to the Rakhi Ghadi woman? And the answer is yes. And I find this mind blowing. Not because it is evidence of out of India. In fact, in some simple minded sense, it is not. They have not contributed DNA in those locations because they are outliers in those locations. So clearly, they are anomalous there, genetically speaking. But culturally speaking, they are an established presence there because they were ceremonially buried there. What you have, and now I'm hand wave, but what you have is the fascinating possibility of established trade run by trading houses which only married within themselves, yet lived in far flung locations. Didn't marry there, which is why they are genetic outliers there but are culturally located there because they were ceremonially buried there. And really, for me, the heartwarming and incredible possibility is that 5,000 years ago, we had sophisticated and established and stable in trade rules that trading families existed. I mean, is this not far more enriching to our own understanding of our species than some chauvinist notions of how everybody from us? <laughs> Last part, but I still have to drag you to the, <coughs> the chauvinist analysis of talking that one skeleton in Rakhigari about 4,500 to 4,800 years back proves that there was no steps migration into in South Asia and that of course does not explain how do you see the step signature in shall we say South Asian population particularly northwest to North South Asia quite honestly and this is the reason I didn't even bring up that issue although it is formally part of my <coughs> list of interesting Kigadi. But quite honestly, responding to this particular piece of uh, uh, chauvinism feels pointlessly silly. It's almost like seriously asking a transplant surgeon to respond to prime ministerial claims <laughs> of the ancient uh, province of transplant surgery based on the ongoing Ganesh festival here in Pune. So, to, to you, the I, answer would be, I'm, it is sullying, we are sullying, having to respond. Sati, this is sullying the enterprise of science, which is the grand one of knowledge, uh, with, shall we say, uh, everyday ideological projects, which are really have a completely political purpose, have really no uh, purpose in terms of discovery of knowledge. This is I agree, this is flattening the extraordinarily rich landscape that science brings to our own understanding of ourselves and our world into what amounts to petty chauvinism. Thank you, Satyajit, on that note. And uh, we shall try and, shall we say, restrict more of our discussions to the larger issue of knowledge than addressing the petty chauvinism of a certain petty people, shall we say. But let's also face it, that project, though an independent one of science, still remains politically a very important uh, project to contest. Thank you very much, Satyajit, for being with us, trying to explain difficult issues from Pune. Thank you. This is all the time we have with NewsClick today to discuss this and other issues. Do keep watching NewsClick.